command. And the reason for that is, is so that you have a little bit of, an in, of instruction before you go off half cocked. Uh, I've been reminded even, uh, even recently of the importance of making sure, like for instance, uh, when it comes to working on a new car now, it's entirely different than when I was uh, back in the 70s or 60s, late 60s. Cars are not the same anymore. You almost have to have a, de a degree with computers to be able to work on a car. In my days, you depended on the mechanic to come in and listen to the car, and sometimes they'd even take an extension and put the thing down on the block and be able to listen, tell you if the lifters were stuck or if the cam was worn out or the rocker arms were bad and all the stuff you don't know anything about now. And nowadays, they take the thing with the prong in it and pull a fuse out and stick the thing in there. And it's like a doctor with a stethoscope. They listen to how it, how it ticked. It's all changed now. And so the importance of having instruction so that you don't have to, as my daddy used to say, lick your calf twice. It's important to know the direction that you're going before you just go off in the direction you think things are going and then find out you're wrong and then have to wind up backing up. So the Apostle Paul lays some things out for you as far as that. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. It's not blindly follow me. It's where you see me lining up with Jesus Christ, then you follow after me. That'll keep your biblical doctrine right. Now, one of the things that you find in the last days is, is people no longer have a taste for doctrine because doctrine's absolute. Doctrine is also a divider. I don't know if you know that or not. All churches are not the same. The gospels are not the same. The preaching of the gospel is not the same. And you don't like, well, put it aside just because, you know, we want to, for the sake of getting along. No, that's not how things work or operate. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you any other gospel than that which I preached, let him be accursed. That's mean, let him be anathema, let him, be, let him go to hell is what he's saying to them. Leave them alone, don't mess with them, because why? They're damning people's souls. And you say, well, but they have some of it right. A little bit of it will hurt you as much as uh, all of it. It only takes one little tiny drop of uh, strychnine in a whole glass of water to contaminate the whole glass of water. So the thing that's hard for us to understand is, and I just told a, a young preacher this the other day, he was asking some sincere questions, and he was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and I used something I got from a black preacher years ago. He taught a, a preacher's class. He's an, he's an old preacher. He was way up in his 80s, and he was asked to teach this class. And in that class, there were a number of things that I took notes on, but one of the things he said about being filled with the Holy Ghost, about being filled with the Holy Spirit, about walking in the Christian life, he said two things that are worth remembering. Number one, he said, you can't out-preach your life. Right. Meaning, if you're not living it, you, no matter what you preach, you can't out-preach how bad you're choosing to live. So you have to be careful about choices you make. Paul's going to deal with that here in just a minute. You're living in a day and time where Christians don't think about how they come off to other people. They're getting closed in and thinking, I have a right to live my life the way I do. Well, you do, but if you're going to live your life for Christ, you don't. Whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all to the what? Glory of God. If your body belongs to Him, do all to the glory of God. It's all through there. You'll hear something about that this morning. The second thing he said is, is in reference to, uh, and he quoted 2 Timothy 2.15, and he said in reference to uh, you young men being uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, he said your Holy Ghost doesn't come from the top down. He said it comes from your hind end up. And he said it comes from applying your seat to the chair and sitting there and studying long enough for the Lord to give you something through the hours and hours and hours of study, and it works from your hind end up. And if you're not willing to sit down and study, your congregations will starve, and then your personal life will fall apart. Well, I think that's very much worth noting, because nowadays you have a tendency on the part of people, we're lazy when it comes to that. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. Uh, I heard the old preacher say not long ago, he was preaching and he was, you know, he got on the TV or not TV and that is the question, kind of a deal. I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes and so on and so forth. And he said this, he said, uh, I'll grant you that the television has uh, created all kind of problems and he listed a number of them and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. For every hour you spend watching television, how about half an hour with the Bible? Now think about it. The average person watches seven hours of TV a day. 
That's not screen time. That's YouTube time and that's not working. That's screen, that's pleasurable time going through cat videos or whatever's out there, TikTok or Twitter, the scrolly thing and sitting in front of the TV. Now, if you start at six or 6.30 in the evening and watching the evening news and then you watch the thing until the 11 o'clock news, that's a good solid five hours. So two and a half hours in your Bible. Yeah, see how that just went over? It's like, well, that's a little bit ridiculous. Well, no wonder we're biblical infidels then. <laughs> we're ignorant. Now, I look back there at Brother Eddie and I realize he's got all the qualifications and I call him Doc. Whether you do or not, you call him whatever you want to call him and he'll, he'll give you all the don't call me that. I can call him what I want to call him. But uh, I, I, he has the wisdom of that. I know some nurses that have that kind of wisdom. You talk to them, they know as much as a doctor does. But the, I look at Brother Eddie. Now, think about this. I can't tell you how many years, but I was with him during the years. He continued to study and continued to study and continued to study. And he had to stay up with everything for every change in position he had. And now what he does now, he has to continue to study and take boards and take exams and get qualifications. So then he's qualified to treat you. Right. Yes. Well, what do you think a preacher's supposed to do? He's supposed to continue to study and continue to study and continue to study. You say, what? It's continuing education, ladies and gentlemen. It never goes away. You never get to the bottom of God. And so we all ought to have that responsibility. That passage on study to show yourself approved and give attendance to reading, that's not written to just preachers. That's written to you. Now, the Apostle Paul writes that up, but Paul is always under the authority of somebody. Paul was big on that. And Paul was a big shot when he was over there with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that. But then after that, he counted it all but dung. And then he comes to this passage here in 1 Thessalonians. And we left off last uh, Wednesday night, we left off with the thing in reference to fathers. Notice what he says. We exhorted and comforted and charged you. And a good father does that. Encourage you, exhorted you, and then comforts you. Sometime you have to do that. And then every now and then, what you have to learn to do is, is you have to charge an individual. To charge is not always to correct. A father doesn't spend all of his time correcting. A charge simply means to realign or to get an individual. Well, for instance, when we ordain somebody, we, have, we preach what's called a charge. In other words, the Apostle Paul acts like a father with Timothy. And he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, he said, Preach the word, be instant in season, to charge. And out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and be turned from the truth into fables. Now that's a charge. A charge is not always, as it's preached oftentimes, it's always correction. I mean, there's a lot of times that instruction and in righteousness is given to you, so you don't have to have the rebuke or the reproof. If you learn how to do it right the first time, then you're less likely to make a mistake. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, if somebody tells you, now you're living in a day and time where people don't want instruction. They're used to going to something on YouTube to find an answer for something and they think they got all the answers and everybody thinks they're a doctor, everybody thinks they're a lawyer, everybody thinks they're whatever specifics there are. People go on YouTube to find, uh, YouTube to find out what the law is and then they come out to be, used to be jailhouse lawyers. Now they're YouTube lawyers and they want to go in there. No degree, they're not recognized in court. They don't have any credentials. Do you understand? If you spend as much time studying the Bible and studying the Lord Jesus Christ as you do studying other people's wrongdoings, you might find that your Christian life is a lot happier. Too many of you are hooked up to what everybody else is doing and you can't enjoy happiness unless everybody else is doing what you ought to think. Listen, nobody is going to always fly high and tight and spit white. Never going to happen. It isn't going to happen with your own children. It's not going to happen with your grandchildren. And it's not going to happen with everybody in the church. You say, why? Because we're feeble and frail as dust and we're human beings. We're whacked out as a soup sandwich. So the Apostle Paul gives you some guidelines, some things, and a father will charge. That's what a preacher does sometimes is give you a blueprint to follow. Now you look around here at all this stuff here, and you can't tell it now you, you, unless you walked in and out of here while all it was going on. But there's all kind of stuff going on in here, electric and plumbing and fire sprinklers and air conditioning, duct work and all kind of stuff that's on here. Right now it's covered up beautifully with ceiling tiles and with drywall and, and carpet and all that kind of a 
deal. Underneath this carpet is concrete. Underneath that concrete is a bunch of rebar. And underneath that rebar is uh, uh, sand and dirt that was packed down to a certain degree. You don't pay any attention to that stuff. You say, where'd you get that from? Off a of blueprint. And listen to me. Every part of that process had to be inspected before you could move to the next process. You say, what? It's important how your foundation is laid. If the foundation is not correct, then guess what's going to happen? Eventually, the building's going to lean, or the bad wind's going to come, and I'll show you that in a minute, or the flood, the rains are going to come, and the floods are going to come, and it's going to knock the thing off the foundation. You say, why? Because your foundation's built in the wrong place on the wrong thing. I'm not trying to be harsh with you this morning when I tell you this. You're living in a day and time where there are two things that they want to get rid of. They want to get rid of doctrine and a denomination. They don't want you to be what you claim to be, meaning don't call yourself a Baptist. Just call yourself a Bible church. No, I'm a Baptist. Why? Because that makes a statement. Now, you know, you're saying you're supposed to identify yourself. Okay, I'm identifying myself. Why? So people know when they come in, I'm a Baptist. I'm not a Southern Baptist, a regular Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist. I'm a Bible believer first. I'll give you a biblical history on what all Baptists are because all Baptists are not the same. There's Baptocostals and Pentecostal Baptists and all kind of other things. We're Baptists based upon what we believe here. That's nomenclature. You say, well, it divides people. It's supposed to. See, the misunderstanding is, is we open up the doors and anybody comes of any flavor. No, that's not Pauline at all. Paul said there's separation that's involved. Your first separation, ladies and gentlemen, following the Apostle Paul, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I'm in Romans 12, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and watch, and be not conformed to the world but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now the first separation that happens after you're saved is I'm given a command that says to me, you're not to be like the rest of the world. If you love the world, you're at enmity with God. I can still be at enmity with God and be saved, my soul saved, but my flesh can be at enmity with God and I can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit because I've chosen to follow after my flesh. Are you with me so far? Your first command as a Christian is you're not allowed to be and act and look like the rest of the world. Be not conformed to the world. Now, when a preacher says that, you think he's just a hard-nosed standard preacher and you're talking about, you know, haircuts and hemlines and pants and pork and all that. No, the world's theology applies also. Not just how you do That's kid stuff, how you look. Listen, the schools even know that. They make your kids wear uniforms to school and they tell you in school you can't wear this and you can't wear that. You get ready to go visit a prison, there'll be a dress code that'll be there. And then to say, if you want to go see the prisoner in there, you have to dress a certain way. You're not allowed to do certain things. You don't want to abide by the rule. Don't visit your loved one in prison. But if you say that in church to a Christian, immediately, oh, you're just legalistic and you're just talking about saying, that's your first command. That's for kids. That's for children. That's for babes in Christ. You don't get to live your own life anymore. You have to live your life like Jesus Christ. You're no, you've been bought with a price. Serve God now. Well, would God do what you do? WWJD, would Jesus do that? No, modern Jesus would. Modern Jesus, you know, he'd look like some of you. Probably have wean ticks and a three-piece suit, three suit and he'd walk around, you know, and, and be listening to what you listen to and doing what you're doing. Uh, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible went contrary to the world's ways. But that's gone nowadays. Nowadays you don't see that very much. And some of you that are visitors here, I was just reminded yesterday, been a while since I pulled out the dispensational chart. Preacher, we got all kind of new people there, visitors, and you probably should be teaching that again. I said, okay, I agree with you, that's right. But let's get step number one. Before you worry about a dispensational hair and learn where to split it, let's get step number one. You're not supposed to be like the world. Amen. That's why when you come in here, you don't get rock and roll music. And you don't have stuff plastered up on the screen. You have a hymnal. Amen. That's why you have a Bible in your lap. You say, what? To keep me honest. Amen. You can check and see if I'm giving you what's in the Bible. If it's contrary to the Bible, throw it out. Amen. You don't have to listen to it just because I said it. If it's in the Bible, though, you know what? Your problem's with him. You're not to be conformed to the world. This isn't this mass popular opinion. This is God's opinion. That's it. God said it. That settles it. What we think about it doesn't make any difference. Right. You say, what are you doing? I'm fixing to give you verse 13. The word of God effectually worketh in them that believe. Amen. That's not just for salvation. 
Do you believe what he said in Romans 12? How many of you believe Romans 12 is inspired by God? Do you believe Romans 12, 1 and 2? Why don't you do it? You still look and act and talk and, and conduct yourself like the world? Well, but preacher, you have to learn to get along with people. Where did you get that? Why can't they get along with you? Why is it always you having to kowtow to what they want you to do? It's never to get you closer to Jesus. It's always to pull you away. You make them uncomfortable. Why is that? Why is it that when some of you girls meet these Yahoo guys that are out here, dogs is a great name for them, why is it that all of a sudden they want to take you away from where you were born and bred in the Lord and while they want to, how come they don't, if they really want you, why don't you bring them here? Amen. Well, but preacher, you know, they, they, wouldn't really, they wouldn't really hang around here very much. Okay, well then they must have a backbone like a cotton string then. Amen. I mean, I'm not some big old roaring lion. And my goodness gracious, man, I'm a feeble old man now. He can't come in here and sit and listen for a couple of hours a week. Are you kidding me? You think he's going to endure a marriage with you? I mean, he's going to listen to you chirping and that chin music and that pie hole is going to be open all the time, man. He's going to be listening to you every day, all day. He can't take a couple of hours from a grown man. He hasn't got enough character to float a boat, man. You say, well, but, but preacher, no, that's a great character tester. You say, why? Jesus first. Yes, sir. That's a great way to start your marriage. I can tell you that whenever your marriage goes south, it's because one or both of you is out of fellowship with the Lord. Only by pride cometh contention. Right. You having contention with your spouse, one or both of you is proud. You won't back off. Yes. I mean, sometimes you know what you do? You just have to go ahead and throw up the flag. You say, why? Peace is worth a lot. But you just got to win, don't you, ma'am? You just have to have the last word. Have to say the last thing. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'll give you some verses on that in a little while. Some of you are thinking, what is this, Marital Counseling 101? <laughs> There's all kind of books outside of the Bible now trying to tell you what you ought to be doing. Uh, there's some dangerous stuff going around by some people from up there in Tennessee and that stuff is out of the pit of hell itself and you don't even know it because you don't know what it's connected to but that stuff was connected to the basic institute for life principles and that kind of a deal. That stuff went around and has damned more kids and more marriages than you can imagine and you pass that just so that you know in case you're reading that I didn't condone it. You don't have to run it by me. I'm just telling you I want you to know I'm ad adamantly opposed to all that. You say why? Well, just trust me when I tell you, I know the truth behind all that. Right. I know you feel you can discern it, you can get it and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you're going to wind up getting abused and abusing your kids is what you're going to wind up doing. That's free of charge. It doesn't cost you anything. They use the wrong sources. They don't have any qualification to speak the way they're speaking. I'm pausing because there's a lot of things I'm trying not to say. But, but because you're too easily influenced, um, you pick up something and think there's some secret to this. I've seen kids that have been raised in a Christian home go to Christian kindergarten and Christian school and Christian camp and be in church since nine months where they were born and you couldn't find them right now with a halogen flashlight. And I've seen kids that were raised on the street and drug everywhere they went all over the creation, been in and out of prison and this and that and the other. And they're sitting in a Bible-believing church and some of them are preachers today. You say, what is that? At some point it comes down to free will. It doesn't come down as much to parenting as you think it does. That's just some way for a sucker to make them make money off of you. It's the same thing as Dr. Spock that just put some scripture in it. Make money off of you. Why don't you read the Bible? Why don't you see what God says about it? Why don't you spend some time running some cross-references? You'd rather read some counseling book by some woman to tell you about how to be a wife? Why don't you just see what God says about being a wife? Instead of putting in some psycho babble modern language to make you think she's in touch with you. She ain't in touch with you. She doesn't know how you live. And you're not married to her. Can I tell you ladies something right quick? There ain't a man in here that's the same except as far as his, his uh, anatomy is concerned. They're not a man in here. They're like fingerprints or snowflakes. Every one of them is different. 
and God puts you with them and he didn't put you with them to straighten them out. You've been trying for 30 years. How's it working out for you? <laughs> he may capitulate here and there and those kind of things. And gentlemen, there ain't a woman in here that's the same. That's why you dwell with them according to knowledge. You ain't gonna ever understand them. No, no way you can understand them. You say, why? They're all different. And a lot of their way they are is because of who you are. And they have to make adjustments. That's why you can't just throw a blanket over the thing and say, well, if you do the following things, no matter what church you go to, no matter what denomination, no matter what doctrine, if you just apply these basic life principles, everything's going to turn out okay. Yeah, well, I can give you a whole lot that hadn't turned out okay, including, yeah, I got to stop, I got to stop, I got to stop. All right, we're talking about as a father. I'm just giving you an admonition. I'm giving you a warning. Uh, spend some time in your Bible. All right, look in verse number 12. Verse number 12, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. What would walk worthy mean, preacher? Well, I think it's pretty well, um, I think it's pretty well known what walk worthy is. Walk worthy doesn't mean that I'm living a certain way to preserve my salvation, to keep my salvation, to prove I'm saved. It's now that I'm saved. When somebody sees my life, they realize I was a worthy recipient of what? How I live. How, your li how you live your life in front of other people matters so much. There's scores of verses in there. And nowadays they're departing from that like you live your life in a vacuum. You are out in front of everybody now nowadays because of this stupid phone and pictures of everything and selfies and duck lips and all that other stuff and the computer and the television and sending out emails and sending out texts and filming everything everywhere you go. You don't have privacy anymore. You don't have any privacy anymore. You say, what happened? The devil saw to it that because you're in everybody's life, you think you have a right to be in everybody's life. I wish some of you would be as concerned about souls going to hell as you are about what the next person's doing or posting your latest post about where you are. This is me. I'm having coffee. Okay. This is me. I just had a biscotti with my coffee. This is me. I'm boarding a plane. This is me. Oh, well, I can't tell you where I'm at but it says men only. <laughs> I'm finished now. This is me washing my hand. That, you say, preacher, it's not like that. Oh, yes, it is. And you know what happens when somebody gives you that little bit of information about them? You feel a responsibility to get back with them with some personal information about you. And before long, you know, and run your big mouth about stuff you have no business talking about to anybody else. And most times it's stuff from your past that nobody needs to know right, about. Right. Amen. So who are you to tell me? Just a preacher. Do with it what you want. Throw it in the trash. But I've lived long enough to see that stuff tear families apart. You have to remember when I started nearly 40 years ago doing this, but 33 or 4 here, you have to remember I started before all that stuff was around. I've seen the difference that stuff's caused and created in families. I've seen families torn apart by it. I've seen Christians torn apart by it. I've seen people that are no longer in church because of it. Your silence amens what I'm saying. And if you're the recipient of it, there's no taking it off of there. There's no getting rid of it. All right, so we said to walk worthy. Would you agree that that means let's thank God for the blood, forget about the past, and let's do something with the future. Let not your good be evil spoken of. Yes. Are you doing some good things now? Yeah, good. Then don't, don't, don't go back into your history too far. You know, whatever you did, okay, you did it. We don't need to know about it. That's all they're going to remember about you. All right, come down now to verse number 13. This is my text for where I want to get today here, if I can. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Why? Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but it as in fact, the, uh, as in truth, excuse me, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you, also in you, that what? So you have to believe what he has to say about it. Come over to, uh, let's see, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2. I'll give you some Old Testament examples. Do you believe when God says that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God? Do you believe that? Yes, sir. Yes. Do you live a life that would cause you to lead other people away from hell? 
I mean, if you really believe it. Do you believe in the fires of the judgment seat of Christ? Do you believe in the terror of the Lord? Why don't you live like it? I mean, you tell me that you love your wife, gentlemen, right? Does she know you love her? Well, yeah, she knows I love her. Does she know because of how you live or what you say? You say you love the Lord. Okay. Do you do what the Lord would have you to do? You said you believe the book, right? The Thessalonians believed what Paul said and they acted on it. They responded to it. This is not a game that we're involved in here. It's something that's deadly serious. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 4. That's why when an individual comes around to you and asks you questions, you're dealing with their soul. And the Apostle Paul's dealing with them and the Lord deals with the Pharisees there and he says, you make your, the, the people that follow you a twofold child of hell and there's reserved for you in eternity a greater damnation. That's to a false teacher who's teaching something other than what God said. Well, when people watch your life, do they see something contrary to what God said? Are you any less guilty than the Pharisees who were teaching their own doctrine? The God of the relaxed, the God of the chilled out, the God of the walk in the world and, and have a good time and that kind of, you just don't get too close to the line. Is that, you, you said you believed it, right? You believe in the fires of the judgment seat of, hell, uh, judgment seat of Christ. Is that right? The terror of the Lord. Is that right? Do you live Romans 12? 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 4, the Bible says, make it 3, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but watch it, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but in what? The power of God. Demonstrated by the life he lived and the words that he spoke. Look down in verse number 10, same passage. God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse number 13, which things also we speak, not in the words that man's wisdom teacheth, but the which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Come to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians 3. What he's talking about is a demonstration of, of uh, the, the uh, Spirit. And the Spirit is not done by uh, uh, praise and worship hour. Somebody came in when we were first building this thing here and so on and so forth and the size of the platform and all here. And they asked, are you going to have a, a, a worship leader over here and a worship leader here and a worship leader over here? And I said, what? It was a construction guy. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you know, you go to other churches that are about this size. They have a big platform. He said, they have a worship leader on either side, a praise and worship team. I said, we have a guy who stands behind the pulpit and flaps his arm like a chicken. They get up behind the pulpit and sing. And I appreciate him singing over here. We have to work on that a little bit. I know you want to be over here in the cubby hole, but people over there can't see you. And you get up behind the pulpit and sing. And you say, what is that? That's, that's all you get. We're not here to look like the rest of the world. I'm not here to get you jumping Jim, Jiminy Jehoshaphat and can't, can't sit still and get up here and do all the stuff they do at a football game. I'm not a cheerleader. I'm a preacher. Amen. You say what? I, I'm susceptible to the same feelings and emotions you are. I have to put them down just like you do. Sometimes I have to put them down because sometimes I look at you and think, well, they don't want to hear nothing I say. And it'll look at somebody and you probably just got a stomach ache or you got a little gas because you ate too much pizza last night or something. And I just happen to lock eyes with you right when I say something and I see your face turn sour and the devil says, see, they're about to walk out. They're going to quit. They're going to do it. And they, he, he's working on me. I have to stick with what the book says. You think that's not hard? You say, what is that? I'm a human being. I'm not an AI. I don't get my sermons by going to some chat bot. And you ought to have enough sense to be able to tell when somebody's using that kind of foolishness because there's a different spirit attached to it. You say, what is that? Paul said, when you heard us talk, you knew who was behind that, where the energy comes from. You get somebody to come in there and, and kick out a, a, a whole outline and things like that by a chat bot for a sermon. Well, does that chat bot inspired by God? How can it be? It's a robot. 
I know what I'm talking about. You know what the professors at colleges are doing now? If they catch you, they expel you. You know what the law firms are doing now? If they catch you, they disbar you. And you got lazy preachers that are now doing that. You say, what? It's impressive. You get all these sources and get them to do that. You know how you get the sources? You put your behind in the seat and you get your concordance and a dictionary and you stick with it and you pray the whole time and ask God to give you something. I don't care if it's three points in a poem. There'll be three points inspired by God instead of 30 points inspired by a computer. It's not entertainment. I'm positive I'm not entertaining. Not all the time anyway. Galatians chapter number three. I feel pushback on that. Preacher, you got to catch up with the times. Please have me removed. Amen. I'm going to find out the spirit of the age and if it's going this way, I'm going that way. Amen. I'm not changing that just because we got some empty seats in the pews. So well, we'll get rid of you. Okay, well you can do that if that's what you want to do, but I'm not changing that. Well, preacher, you got to learn to change. I'm not changing if you can show me chapter and verse to change, I'll change it. But I'm not compromising biblical doctrine or the King James Bible just to make your friends happy. Amen. It's what got us where we are and we're not changing it. And the last days, there's pressure. You need to listen to me. There's pressure on your pastor to change, to knock it off, to cool it down, to ease it up, to back off. You say, you're kidding. I mean, after all the years, yeah, more now than ever in all the years I've been here, constantly, just little drop, just little innuendos, just little things. Galatians chapter number five, uh, three, verse number five. Paul says, and he therefore ministered to you, in, uh, you the spirit and worketh miracles among you. Doth he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, even as Abraham believed God and was accounted unto him for righteousness. You know what Paul says? He said, when somebody ministers to you, there's an in exchange going on. The spirit in him is speaking to the spirit in you. And between my mouth and your ears, there is bajillion demons floating around out there doing everything they can to disrupt the connection. And that's why sometimes your phone will go off and not the times that you pinch the baby on purpose, but the times the baby goes off or whatever. Whenever there's opposition to the Word of God going out, you can be sure God's got something for you to get and you have to learn to fight through that. It'll be the time where somebody fidgets around or they'll do the Baptist salute, you know. Uh, early you'll see them. Used to I worried about video games and stuff in the church. And then, you know, we got to where we did a little bit better with telephones and now it's the... We're getting ready to have a new thing when they get it up and running here with these little um, circles, these little discs for the ladies in the nursery. And somebody said, well, you should just use the phone and text them. Are you kidding me? You wouldn't be just checking for a text on that baby in the nursery. You're going to pick that phone up and that big old poof, it's going to glow out here. And then you're going to punch and then the next thing you know there's a text and there's a text. And there's a, you say, what, you're bored to death with me talking. You say, but the preacher, you know, things have changed nowadays. I don't care. I don't have to change with that. Amen. I mean, we're better than we used to be. We used to, back years ago, we'd walk in the service and say, hey, your kid's acting up. Can you come get him? And then I was told that's a little bit harsh. And so we got these little, she got these little beeper things. And man, we thought we were in high cotton. So now, you know, it goes off. And, and then people take them home with them, never bring them back. I guess they're waiting for the restaurant to call them or something. But once we get those things, you say, well, why don't you use the phone? It's the idea of you using your phone in place of a Bible. Guy comes in here and he's got him an iPad. He ought to feel so out of place. He doesn't even know what to do. It's kind of like... Where's everybody's iPad? We don't use them in here. Amen. Well, I use them for work and use them for, yeah, well, here we use a Bible. Right. Amen. We need to get modern. Then go, go, there's plenty of places that are modern. Why are you so interested in changing me? Amen. Well, we want you to change. No, no. Go somewhere else and let them change for you. I walked into McDonald's, if I just hypothetically, I walked in McDonald's and I said, I want a Whopper. And they said, that's, that's not us. We have two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. I, I know, but I want a Whopper. We don't sell that here. That's Burger King. Well, I want you to sell it here if you want my business. Well, if you want our business, you get a Big Mac or a quarter pounder with cheese. But if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to go down the road. But you come to church and you know what you say? 
I'm going to have it my way. You're not lined up with the Bible. You say, why? Ladies and gentlemen, there is pressure on you to try to make the church worldly to make you feel comfortable. Turn the cat around if the fur is rubbed the wrong way. Line up with what God says. Well, I don't like it. Well, it's worked pretty well for us for 30 something years. With this idea that we, it's now everybody's church. No, it's not. It's not my church. It ain't your church. It's his church. Amen. We have to be pleasing to him. Well, I went to such and such a church and they got ping pong and pool tables and they got pizza and they got all this other kind of stuff. Praise the Lord, man. Go there. Do you think that's going to put pressure on me to provide those things for you to keep you coming? Why, you don't even come on Wednesday night. So what you're doing is to tell me, but if you'll bring this stuff in here, then we'll have it. No, then it'll become a den of iniquity and your kids will be coming for games and they'll be necking in the parking lot. Church is for preaching. Amen. What about that big fellowship hall? We'll eat enough times, but most of us, I mean, our belt looks like a fence around a chicken graveyard and it, it ain't going to hurt us. We don't need to be coming to church every time to eat. Help me, Jesus. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter one. Well, back up, go to Acts chapter four. I'm not going to get through this. Acts chapter four. As over the New Testament there, you go into Jeremiah around 42 there and they promise to do what God says and they promise to do all these things and they make a list of those things. And by chapter 43, they refuse to do what God says and everything God said would happen when you get rid of preaching takes place to the nation of Israel. And I'm going to read it to you here in just a minute. I'm going to let you look and see if that's not the state of the majority of churches that you know about in the United States. Your churches nowadays are all on preferences and politics and all the other things that have to do with our personal life and all that kind of stuff. They don't any more preach Jesus from the pulpit than a billy goat. And there's certainly nothing about clean living and righteous living. It's about entertainment and how to cope and how to get along and how to make sure everything's okay and everybody's okay and, and are you okay and I'm okay and he's okay and they're okay and we're all okay and everybody's fine and we're just trying to get through life. I'm not. I'm trying to make it to eternity. Amen. I'm not trying to get through life. What does the Lord, whatever he says every day. Acts chapter number uh, four, look in verse number eight. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of a good deed done to the infinite man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto all you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. You know what he's saying? He's saying that the power of the demonstration of the power, come back to the book of Jeremiah. He's saying the demonstration of power, ladies and gentlemen, it comes from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from a speech class. Now, I'll grant you that there can be improvement in your delivery. And I grant you there can be improvement for, uh, for your preparation. I think those things are important. That's why we have school. But ladies and gentlemen, you can pour your heart and soul into something like that. But if God doesn't bless it, uh, Brother Lynch used to say, he said, man, I got a really good outline, P. And I said, yeah. And he said, it'll be a great message if God gets in it. Amen. And he said, and if God doesn't get in it, he said, it'll just be a good outline. <laughs> If God doesn't inspire the words and God doesn't breathe on the words when they go out, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If God doesn't do that, it doesn't do anything for you whatsoever. Your only part is, is that if it is from God is to believe it. So it'll have an effect on you. Well, is it affecting you? It should affect you for more than just salvation. It should affect you for more than just conviction and correction and instruction. Look in Jeremiah real quick, if you would, please. The Lord here is talking through the, uh, Jeremiah. He's got them all gathered together and he makes some promises to them. If you abide in the land in verse number 10, I will, uh, will I build you and not pull you down and I'll plant you and not pluck you up for I repent of the evil that I have done unto you. And then he says in verse number 13, but if you say we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God. I'm in Jeremiah 42. Excuse me. 
give you a chance to get there. This is important for you to see. You there? Verse 13, 42, 13. But if you say, we will not dwell in the land, neither obey the voice of the Lord, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we will see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, uh, and there we will dwell. Now, the Lord, therefore, the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of the hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and to go to sojourn, then, verse 16, it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared shall overtake you in the land and the famine will be there. You shall die, verse 17, and all the men will set their faces to go to Egypt and sojourn there and they'll die by sword, by famine, by pestilence. None of them shall remain and none of them shall escape. Look all the way down, if you will, to verse number 20. For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord your God. And according to all the word of the, uh, the Lord, our God shall say, So declare it unto us. And now I have this day declared it unto you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for which he hath sent me uh, unto you. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, the famine, the pestilence, the place where ye should to desire to go. So what happens? Uh, they say, well, we won't have any war. We'll quit fighting. We don't have to worry about the trumpet anymore. We're going to quit listening and there's no hunger. Now come to 43. Jeremiah 43, verse 2. Azariah speaks there to Hashaniah and Johanna the son of Kareah, and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speaketh falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not to Egypt and sojourn there. Preacher, you're lying to us. He did too say it, but it's not convenient for him. I tell you, Egypt's the type of the world and don't go to the world. Ah, uh, God didn't say that. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The lover of the world is uh, at enmity with God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These things are contrary. Tell me he didn't say it. He did say it. No, he didn't say that. Baruch, the son of Neriah, set thee against us for to deliver us. They're going to quit fighting now to the hands of the Chaldeans that they might put to death and carry us away captive to Babylon. Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains and forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in Judah. Jonathan, the, uh, Johanan, excuse me, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah. And you can read on down there. You say what happens. They decided to go the way they wanted to. Look in verse number seven. For they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. So you know what the voice of the Lord did for them? Absolutely nothing. The preacher told them what the Lord said and they said, that ain't, that ain't what our God said. That's not true. You say, what happened to them? You read on in Jeremiah, you know what you find out? They all get wiped out. By pestilence, by sword, by famine, uh, they wind up under the necks or under the, the boot of their enemies and they wind up dying there in that land. You say, why? God told them not to go. You know what they said? That isn't what God said. God didn't say that. You're all the way back to Genesis 3, ladies and gentlemen. Yea, hath God said? Listen, whenever an individual gets up there and tries to tell you the meaning of something that God says, they're always hiding an absolute doctrinal truth. Well, what he really meant to say there was, no, what he said was don't go. Well, I, he didn't really say that. I, I mean, I, we sent you out there to, to look at him, to talk to him, to spend time with him. He wouldn't talk to us. He talked to you. But we just don't really believe that that's what he said. Better not go. Well, we're going to go ahead and go anyway. Now, the only reason I bring that up to you, and I'll finish this up here tonight, is to tell you this. If God said it, it's settled. If you don't believe it, it doesn't have any impact on you. You can be here right now lost as a golf ball in high weeds and I can tell you the death and the burial and the resurrection and tell you that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day according to Scripture. I can show you that if you'll admit you're a sinner, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess Him as your Savior, that you can be saved today from a devil's hell burning forever, come out at the end of the millennium and then wind up going to the great white throne and then be cast in a lake of fire forever where the devil and the beast and the false prophet are and death and hell are cast in there. And I can tell you that you know what it'll do for you? It'll just increase your intellect if you don't believe it in your heart. And you'll be lost and you'll go right on to hell. Now, after you're saved, I can tell you what the Bible says, what God says for you. And if you don't believe it, it doesn't have any impact on you at all. 
you don't rightly divide the Bible and do what the Bible says about it, it has no effect. I could get the Bible read to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you don't believe it, it'll have no impact on you. The key, the secret ingredient to the Bible affecting you is believing what he says and acting on it. And if you don't act on it, it isn't going to do you any good at all. Now, that's a sad state of affairs. You say, what? Well, that's the condition of America. They're in the condition, that's not what our God says. Tell me the last time you turned on one of the preachers that's on TV now that's popular and got hundreds of thousands of members and followers and all that other stuff. When's the last time you heard him preach a message out of Jeremiah 42 and 43 and said, you better listen to what God says. Otherwise, judgment's going to call. What preacher preaches about judgment anymore? That's so unpopular. Why, half of you probably won't come back tonight because you don't want to hear about judgment. You say, why? Because you're under it. Because you know it's coming your way. But you're satisfied with it. You're comfortable where you are. You like it. It's, I'm, I'm good. Me and, me and we're good. We're cozy. We're comfortable. He's not upset with me. Right, and he just had this stuff laid on my heart because I'm running a popularity contest. Is it possible, maybe, possibly, that the Lord might be speaking to somebody here? You sure talk to me. I realize in my own personal life, ladies and gentlemen, that the biggest problem between me and God is the one in the mirror. And the reason is, is because I do not allow the Word of God to effectually work in me because I know what it says, but I don't put it into action by believing it. And I'm talking about those hard passages. Here's a hard one. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath be put away from you with all malice, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed the day of redemption. All bitterness? <laughs> Is that easy to do? But then he gives you the qualifier forgiving one another the same way God forgave you for Christ's sake. Yes, sir. Yes. So the stipulation is, is that the kind of forgiveness he gave me, I have to give to others. It's not hard to forgive a friend. Can I get a witness? Uh, you want to be Christ-like? You got to forgive your enemies. Father bless you.